a lot of questions that then I know you raise your hand, but because of time, probably we should proceed with second talk and save your talk, uh, save your questions after the hour. Okay, yeah. So um, Ben, can you share your screen? Okay, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, great. Can everyone hear me all right? Great. Okay, well, thank you, Jinhua, for the, the introduction. And also, I want to thank uh, Sonia and the organizers for, for putting together this, this seminar. It's extremely interesting, and I'll make sure to spread the word about it. Um, so my name is Ben Kerr. I'm a biologist at the University of Washington. And today, I'm going to talk about some relatively new work um, in our laboratory on uh, the biology of plasmids, and specifically how they move from one bacterial cell uh, to another. Um, most of our intuitions about genetic inheritance in biological systems are built on a vertical mode of, of inheritance. Um, so when you look at uh, pictures of parents and offsprings like, like these that I'm showing you here, the, the genes are passed down from parent to offspring. Bacteria, of course, do this as well every time they, they go through binary fission. Um, but bacteria also violate uh, these intuitions by possessing another mode of, of transfer, genetic transfer, transmission, which is a horizontal mode. Um, one of the primary uh, vehicles of that are conjugative plasmids, um, circular pieces of DNA that are, that are passed between unrelated bacterial cells. And the process by which that occurs is called conjugation. Uh, to explain this a little di diagram here, uh, the cell on the left is a plasmid bearing cell. Uh, and that cell is going to form a, a connection with a cell on the right, a plasmid-free cell. It does so by building this apparatus called a pilus um, that draws these cells into close proximity, and essentially a copy of the plasmid is deposited into the formerly plasmid-free uh, cell, making it now a plasmid-bearing one, which is called transconjugant. Um, now, horizontal gene transfer causes some interesting problems for evolutionary biologists. It muddles species concepts. It also causes problems with phylogenetic reconstruction. Indeed, even the basic topology of phylogenies as these sort of strictly bifurcating uh, structures have to be revised because uh, you now have points of convergence where genes get passed between phylogenetically distant uh, lineages. Um, why I find plasmids so interesting is because they lie at this very interesting place and, and uh, with regards to biological individuality. Um, they blur the lines in some ways. Um, that's because these plasmids are have some degree of autonomy, but they also have some dependence on their host. Um, so when we think of where the individual uh, in the system is, do we think of it as the cell and, and it's, uh, it's the plasmid inside it as one individual? Can we think of plasmids as a kind of individual, like a molecular parasite that can move between cells? Should we be thinking of the host and the plasmid each as individuals in a kind of multi-level way, um, perhaps with interests that sometimes align or don't align? Uh, I think this is philosophically interesting, but putting that to the side, one of the reasons why we might care about plasmids is they often house um, antibiotic resistance genes. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, given the ubiquity of drug use in uh, clinical and industrial and agricultural settings, uh, drug resistance is a major health uh, problem. This is just a, a schematic that's a, a projection um, of the deaths attributable to uh, antimicrobial resistance by 2050. Um, this total number here is uh, gonna outstrip uh, by many factor uh, uh, COVID death, death, deaths due to COVID uh, also is larger than the deaths due to cancer. Um, so this is a major, a major health issue. And as I mentioned, uh, drug resistance is often carried on these mobile elements, these uh, conjugated plasmids. Particular concern are plasmids that contain multiple drug resistance uh, uh, genes. Uh, this uh, plasmid is an example that was pulled from a, a Klebsiella uh, pneumoniae um, uh, isolate from, a, from uh, the clinic that had 11 genes uh, coding resistance to all sorts of classes of drugs, beta-lactams, uh, aminoglycosides, sulfonamides, and others. Um, so understanding the process by which these, these uh, plasmids move between uh, uh, cells is sort of important to understanding how resistance and multi-drug resistance spreads between uh, bacteria, specifically pathogens. Now, one of the primary components of, of this process is the rate at which it occurs. Um, and that's what I'm going to be spending most of my time talking about, how get, providing some historical uh, analysis of how this was done, 
um, some theoretical uh, considerations uh, and some experimental approaches to dealing with, with the measuring the rate. But I will also talk briefly at the end about whether the transfer rate itself can, can evolve and we'll, I'll show you some, some results uh, uh, to that effect. So what was the industry standard? How do people go about measuring conjugation rate? Well, almost invariably, it involves the following sort of approach. You take a plasmid bearing cell called a donor because it donates a copy of the plasmid to another cell and a recipient, which receives the plasmid. Um, and you put those two cell types together into a, a, a culture where it which uh, they grow and potentially can transfer the plasmid from donor to, to recipient. If a transfer occurs, you get a third plasma type, again, this, this purple type, which is the transconjugant. Um, and uh, what an experimentalist will do is take those numbers, measure those numbers of donors, recipients, and transconjugants over time, um, and use those numbers to, to calculate a, a metric for uh, the conjugation rate. Now, under, underneath that, that estimate is actually a dynamical model, often a system of differential equations. Um, here are the dynamic variables D, R, and T refer to the donor, recipient, and transconjugant uh, densities. Um, and the model that I'm showing you here is a, a simple model that was derived in the 70s by uh, Levin and colleagues. Um, and it does a pretty reasonable job uh, describing uh, things at low density. So what is being assumed here is that all of these players are expanding at this uh, growth rate given by the brown psi parameter. The other terms that you're seeing here are... Um, transfer terms. They involve the products of uh, plasmid bearing cells, either donors or transconjugants, and plasmid free cells, the recipients. Um, this green gamma parameter is the rate of transfer. That's the parameter we're actually interested in. Now, under certain assumptions, you can solve the system of differential equations. Um, and for a period of growth, given by this T tilde here, you can use that solution to derive a, a estimate for this, this uh, 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 gamma parameter. This was done in the 90s. Um, and, and this is the, the estimate that Simonson and colleagues, I'll call this the SIM estimate and SIM approach for, after the name of the first, uh, of the first author here. Um, and if you have the number of transconjugants, recipients, donors, and the total number of cells, that's N here, as well as an independent estimate of the growth rate, then you have all the ingredients needed for the uh, gamma parameter and an estimate of the conjugation rate. Now this model, like all models, makes certain assumptions which can of course be called into question. Uh, one of the primary assumptions right off the bat that seems off is we're assuming all these populations are growing at the same rate. Um, these sometimes are different species, uh, so that, that's, they're gonna tend to grow at different rates, but, and also possessing a plasmid is often costly. So that means the donor and recipient, uh, transconjugant might grow slower in some cases than the recipient. Easy solution to this is just at, throw on some subscripts uh, to each of these psi parameters and then update your model uh, appropriately for the, with the set of these growth rates. Second assumption that the model makes is uh, from Levin and colleagues is an, another identicality assumption, which is that the rate of transfer from a donor to recipient on the top here is the same as the rate of transfer from a transconjugant to a recipient. Um, of course, that may also not be the case. Um, and again, we solve the problem in the same way, just add a subscript giving the source of the plasmid. And we can again, back in our model, update that with a set of these uh, uh, transfer rates as, as you see here. This more complicated model is what we're gonna be using uh, throughout uh, when, when I talk about some of our approaches. Um, but even with this more complicated model, if we take uh, this model to be a description of the system, we're predicting a deterministic rise in the number of transconjugants. Remember, most assays start with no transconjugants in them. Uh, and often they end with small numbers of transconjugates, which means there's going to be a lot of variation in, in the number of transconjugants from replica to replica, and thus variation in the estimate uh, that we have that's based on that, that number of transconjugants. Um, so is such variance just a nuisance that we have to deal with, or can we actually embrace the variance in, in some ways and use it to, to derive a, a, a measure, an, an estimate of, of the transfer rate itself? And the answer is we can, uh, and, um, but to appreciate that, I'm gonna take us on a, a bit of a historical detour. So the wavy lines of, of history are now taking us back, back, back to 1943. Um, and in 1943, microbiologist Salvador Luria and uh, biophysicist Max Delbruck designed an extremely clever and now deeply influential experiment to adjudicate competing hypotheses about the very nature of bacteria. Uh, of, of the mutation in bacteria. Um, 
And the two models that they entertained was that mutations occur spontaneously, was the first model, uh, in the absence of conditions favoring these mutants, or that mutations occurred specifically in response uh, to the uh, selective conditions that favored the, uh, them, that is, mutations were induced. Uh, critical to these hypotheses, both these hypotheses, as well as their experiment, was treating mutation as a stochastic process. Um, the uh, to appreciate that, imagine, if you will, a bacterial uh, sort of population growing as this inverted tree. So each of these bifurcations represents a uh, division event. Um, let's focus on the spontaneous model to start with. Here, mutations can occur anywhere in this, this tree as the, as the population is growing. Um, so for instance, maybe this cell uh, is uh, resulted from a mutational event and is a mutant. I put a halo around the cell here just to distinguish it from other mutant cells that inherited the mutation, like the daughters of this, this uh, mutant cell here. Perhaps you have another mutational event giving a mutant here. Um, and if we're interested after a period of growth uh, of measuring the number of mutants in the population, the way, of course, we would do that is we would take an auger dish here seen from the side and impregnated with a, a drug if we're looking for drug resistant mutants or phage if we're looking for phage resistant mutants and plate that population out the bottom of the tree here um, and each of those mutant cells would generate a colony on that on that plate here seen from the side. Now that we would have had in this case by the way three uh, mutant cells three colonies um, however for another replicate you could have had these two mutational events mutational events could have happened at other places in the tree and you would have gotten two colonies or you could have had these three mutational events given four mutant cells, and that would produce these four columns, or perhaps these three mutational events, and you would have five mutant cells and thus five mutant colonies and so on. So you'll get variation from one replicate to another. Now for the induced model, it's, we also have a, a, a mutation taken to be a random process, but here it works differently. There's no mutation occurring during the growth. The mutations are supposed to happen right when the cells hit the auger dish, that is when in the presence of the, sel the selective pressure. And each cell flips a little coin that comes up uh, heads, you become a mutant with some probability. Um, so maybe these three cells get heads and form mutant colonies, or maybe it's these two or these four. So the, again, there's variation in, in this. This actually conforms to a binomial distribution, but if the cell number is very large and the mutation probability is very small, that's well approximated by Poisson uh, distribution. Um, the spontaneous model has its own uh, distribution, which is different uh, from the induction model as well. And that means that statistical signatures across replicates in an experimental context can be used to support one of these models over the other. And that's precisely what Lurie and Delbrook uh, did. Uh, for instance, the variance to mean ratio for uh, uh, the induction models is predicted to be unity, uh, whereas it, for the spontaneous model, it's predicted to be larger than unity. And the reason is because occasionally you can get uh, mutations high up in the tree, which lead to lots of, of uh, mutant uh, descendants and a so-called jackpot of these mutant colonies in that in that, that tends to inflate the variance relative to the mean. Um, the, incidentally, what Lurie and Delbrook found support for was for the spontaneous model um, and uh, the, something for which they, uh, a few years later, won the Nobel Prize. Um, why am I spending so much time talking about the Lurie and Delbrook experiment? It, it's because it's a beautiful experiment and, and everybody should know about it if they don't. Um, but also it has some relevance to what we're trying to do here today. So I, I wanna try to make that connection. Fundamentally, again, what Lurie and Delbrook were dealing with was uh, mutation as a stochastic process, uh, moving from a wild type to this mutant state and trying to, and they also uh, uh, gave some ways to measure that, which we'll talk about in a second. We are doing, we actually um, are dealing with just another stochastic process of transformation, which is conjugation. Um, but it's a little bit more complicated than the process that uh, uh, Lurie and Delbrook were, were dealing with. So we have to look at two entwined trees, if you like here. Um, if you focus just on the, the tree with black edges to start here, um, this, uh, we're in analogy with the, what you're seeing on the left, we're talking about transformation. Whoops, seems like my, oh yeah, there it goes, sorry. My computer was lagging there. Transformation from a recipient to a transconjugate, okay? But because mutations, or excuse me, because uh, um, plasmids don't just spontaneously appear like mutations do, um, we have to track another population of cells. This growing gray donor tree has to be incorporated as well. Um, so that leads to some differences, of course, between the Luria Delbrook measure and what we're going to show here. But there's also some fundamental similarity, which I will highlight that isomorphism uh, as, as we go. To motivate this, I want to uh, 
refer to a, a pivotal scene in Tim Burton's adaptation of Sleepy Hollow. Um, in this scene, uh, the police constable Ichabod Crane is walking through the forest with a young apprentice, Masbeth, and Masbeth notices that there's no sound, that there's no birds, there's no crickets, there's no wildlife. And this leads these characters to think that they're in some sort of supernatural presence, which leads them to the crone witch, who then tells them some information about the headless, headless horseman, and that moves the whole plot along in, in this in the story. But for our purposes here, what's interesting about this scene is it's the lack of something, in this case, the lack of sound, that gives critical information to these characters. For us, it's also the lack of something, specifically and ironically, the lack of transconjugants that gives critical information about the conjugation rate itself. Um, so because this is a physics audience, I thought I would share a couple of the mathematical details, um, and I'm happy to go into much more detail if people are interested. Um, just as a reminder for that more complicated model, we have these dynamical models, the dynamical variables of donors, recipients, and, and transconjugants. And then, of course, we've got our subscripted growth rates and uh, conjugation rates, the, the size and, and gammas. And we're going to model the transconjugant population here as a continuous time branching process. Uh, the probability of zero transconjugants, so we start with zero transconjugants, the probability that we still have zero transconjugants at some time, T tilde, um, can be uh, analytically derived. Um, we represent that as P naught. So this is Masbeth's principle. We're focusing on the absence of, of transconjugants, or, or at least the probability of the absence. Um, that actually probability exponentially decreases at an exponentially increasing rate, and it's given by the expression that you're, you're looking at here. Now, in that expression is gamma d. That's the transfer rate of the donor. That's what we're actually interested in estimating here. So we can just solve uh, for, for gamma d, and we then get an expression for our, our conjugation rate, which is shown here. Um, this expression turns out to be sim quite similar uh, in, in important ways to the mutation estimate by Luria and Delbruck. We call this the LDM, the Luria Delbruck method, because of, of the similarity of, of approach uh, that we use to, to Luria and Delbruck. This is the mutation, I, I, I drive this in a slightly different way, so this is not quite how it appears in their paper. Um, and if anyone wants to talk about those details, I'm happy to get into it, but mutation rate is mu. Again, if you look at this expression and you look at our expression, they're very, very close, except that the role being played by the wild type growth rate, that's psi n here, is being played by the sum of the donor and, and recipient growth rates. And the role of initial wild type density here and not is being played by the product of initial densities of donors and recipients. P naught for us is the probability of the absence of transconjugants. For them, the probability of the absence of mutants. Okay, so very, very structurally related uh, to to, to the Luria Delbruck uh, uh, approach and, and estimate. How, by the way, do we estimate our P naught? This probability of of not having any any mutants. Well, how did Luria and Delbruck do it? Uh, they started with, again, a bunch of these populations um, and looked at the fraction of these populations that had no mutants, no purple cells. That's their, that's, that actually is a maximum likelihood estimate of P0. Um, so we do exactly the same thing, except we start with a set of co-cultures of these uh, recipients and donors and look for the absence, again highlighted in yellow, of purple cells or the transconjugants. Um, in both cases, those are maximum likelihood estimates of this P0 uh, parameter. This we can do actually in the lab in a fairly high throughput way. Um, so I thought I would just trace the assay for you all. You can start with a set of co-cultures. Um, these are uh, cultures that have the donor and the recipient in them. Um, we reserve a, a small set of those co-cultures here in the top right. We're looking down here at a micro titer plate, a deep well micro titer plate. That's how we where we do this in 96 well, well structure. Um, we plate these co-cultures in the top right here uh, and put them on selective media. This is how we get the initial counts for our donors and recipients. We then incubate for some period of time, T tilde, um, and, uh, oh, and then at the end of that T tilde, that's our incubation period, we again plate those same three top right types, and that's how we get our final densities of donors and recipients. During that period of growth, of course, these, these donors and recipients are, are growing in some of the populations, let's say like this one right here, have, uh, have had a conjugation, one or more conjugation events, and thus they have transconjugants. What we then do is we add a transconjugant selecting medium to all of the wells in the, in the entire plate and incubate for a, a long period of time. That uh, is represented by that sort of yellow backing, the addition of that transconjugant selecting medium. What that means is in any well like this top left one here that didn't have any transconjugants, all the cells are killed um, and it's an empty well 
Whereas if you have one or more uh, transconjugants like this well right here did, that it would grow up into a full th thick turbid culture uh, during that, that uh, period of, of incubation. So now it's quite easy to get our p naught. We just look at how many turbid wells we have, or how many empty wells, excuse me, we have over the total number of uh, of, of co-cultures that we started with. That's our the probability of having no transconjugates. We can then use this p naught, this estimated p naught, as well as these uh, donor and recipient initial and final densities, the incubation time, to calculate our our uh, conjugation rate gamma d. Um, I've rewritten this in terms of from the growth rates to uh, just looking at the, the densities, beginning and ending densities, but that's a pretty trivial uh, um, uh, change. So we've got a tech, I, we've got a, a, an approach here. Um, we've done a lot of stochastic simulations. It turns out to be quite precise and, and quite accurate over a, a range of, of, of conditions and parameter shifting values. I'm happy to go into some of that if people are interested, and I'll show in the slide a, a little bit about that as well. Um, but I thought we would try to use it to, to estimate a rate of transfer in an interesting context. And to do so, I'm going to go to an earlier experiment of our lab um, where th this experiment was specifically asking a question about how plasmids and hosts co-evolve um, if they're forced in an evolutionary sense to spend some time together. Um, and the way that that worked in the experiment was just taking a plasmid bearing cell here and placing it in media, this uh, pink hued media that had a drug present and on the plasmid was a, a gene encoding resistance to the drug. Um, so the, the cell can't lose the plasmid here. And we take that this population, just propagate it through serial transfer for many, many generations, hundreds of generations. This is an evolution experiment. What we might expect, because plasmids are often costly, is, a, is an evolutionary reduction in the cost of the plasmid, and that might lead to what's called greater plasmid persistence. Um, persistence is actually measured by another assay, and I'll just briefly mention how that works. So you take your isolate of interest, let's say, for instance, the ancestor here, and you put it in media, in this case, that doesn't have the drugs. So this is uh, like the yellow media is drug-free. Um, now what can happen is the plasmid can be lost, what's called stochastic loss during division, generating a plasmid-free cell which can live. Um, and indeed, if the plasmid is costly, that plasmid-free cell can displace the plasmid-bearing cell over transfers, um, leading to a, a decay curve for that plasmid-bearing cell over time. Now, you can do that same persistence assay for the evolved descendant down here. And if uh, we have greater plasmid persistence, the plasmid is held uh, longer by that, 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 that uh, population over these transfers, we should see a more shallow decay curve of the, of the uh, uh, proportion of plasmid bearing cells. Okay, so this uh, is an example. We've done a, a number of these, but this is one I'll, I'll focus on uh, of an E. coli cell that has a ink P plasmid and over nine transfers, you can see a steep decay curve uh, in the, a persistence assay like this for our ancestor. Um, for the for the six evolved lines for this one ancestor, uh, the decay curves, this is the evolved descendant, were much more shallow that you see here. So you've got greater plasmid persistence. Um, what's underlying that persistence? Well, as I mentioned, uh, the reduction in cost of the growth can, can uh, um, contribute to greater persistence. Uh, so over the period of time that an ancestral plasmid bearing cell might have uh, doubled, perhaps the plasmid free cell has gone through more, more uh, than one doubling, as you can see, as you can see here. If after evolution, that is these, uh, I should have mentioned the, the darker gray cells here are supposed to represent um, um, more evolved cells, the so ones that have accumulated mutations over time. I hope, that, I hope that's clear. Um, if uh, at the, this sort of after an evolutionary sequence, the uh, uh, difference in these growth rates is, is less, right? That can lead to greater persistence of the plasma. It just doesn't get displaced as quickly. And we do have some evidence that this, this is occurring in this, in this case. But there's another possible contributing factor, which is, has more relevance for what I've been talking about, which is the plasma transfer rate might change as well. There's some rate for the ancestor, again, the cells in white here, uh, that they, they form uh, dyads and conjugate at some rate, right? If that rate changes, let's say it goes up, more of these dyads are forming, the uh, uh, presence of the plasma is going to be lifted as, as a consequence of that. That's going to be another contributing factor to greater plasmid persistence, right? So we wanted to focus on this transfer rate because it allows us a nice opportunity to use this uh, uh, LDM approach that I've just outlined. So we do just that. We use our LDM approach. We find that we indeed have a significant uh, increase in the uh, transfer rate in, in this experiment. Uh, so you get, you get almost an order of magnitude greater uh, transfer rate. 
we can also use the SIM estimate, that, that first uh, estimate that I, 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 I started with, which is actually the industry standard. That's what most uh, folks are, are using to, to measure conjugation rate. Turns out that we do get a little hint from ancestor to evolved of an increase, but as you may notice, the LDM differs from the SIM by orders of magnitude. This is a log axis here. So you've got orders of magnitude in your difference of, of your estimates here. Why, why such a big difference? That's by the way, for both the ancestor and the evolved. Um, well, just as a reminder, this is just for reference, we have the estimates here on the far uh, left and we have our dynamic variables and our parameters for our more complicated uh, model. Remember the SIM makes all those identicality assumptions on those parameters. Um, we can do a set of stochastic simulations using a, uh, the Gillespie algorithm. And what we find, I'm not going to sh show one example here for a set of parameter values that you're seeing in the lower right here. Um, this is the conjugation rate of interest. The parameter of interest that we're trying to estimate is on the y-axis here. On the x-axis is another parameter, the transconjugate conjugation rate. That's what we're varying. And the true value of the conjugation rate parameter is 10 to the negative six in, this, in these simulations. You can see the LDM, our approach, is, is quite precise and, and accurate. The SIM approach has a lower precision, but importantly, it also is inaccurate as the transconjugation rate by orders of magnitude, as the transconjugation rate gets much larger than the, the donor conjugation rate. Interestingly, for many plasmid systems, this may be something that naturally occurs. There's something called transitory derepression. When a plasmid enters a recipient, it, it ends up, uh, the, the genes encoding the conjugation apparatus get uh, derepressed. So they are expressed at higher, higher rates, which means transconjugates tend to uh, uh, exhibit a, a transfer at much higher rates than, don than donors, one, uh, cells that have had plasmid for a while. Which would explain why we have this inflation in the in the sim uh, estimate here. There's there's more to the story. If people are interested, I can get into it. Um, but putting the methodological issues aside, um, this is an interesting uh, finding as well that 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 you get an increase in the rate of transfer. And we have a couple of hypotheses for the evolutionary reasons for that. One is that maybe what's happening is mainly a reduction in cost, but you get a pleiotropic effect of these healthier cells being better able to conjugate with other cells. Um, another possibility is that you could have direct selection for higher rates of conjugation if mutations were happening on the plasmid and uh, plasmid don't, uh, bearing cells can donate their plasmid to other plasmid bearing cells. And again, if people want some details, I'm happy to get into that. I think I'm a, a minute or two over, so I'm going to just sum up what we've talked about today. We focused on plasmids. We're interested in them from a public health perspective because they often carry antibiotic resistance. And what we're focused on here is the rate at which they transfer between hosts. We've developed a new metric and an assay to, to pair with that metric um, that's inspired by the Luria Dulbrook approach, which again is fundamentally grounded in the stochastic nature of, in this case, conjugation and for them was mutation. We have used this approach to show how uh, current approaches can be quite biased and, and also that transfer rate can evolve. And with regards to that last point, exposure to antibiotics as occurred in our evolution experiment uh, may not only uh, select for the maintenance of drug resistance and greater persistence of plasmids, but also a greater transferability of these plasmids, at least in some cases, which is sort of a sobering note to end on. Um, so I just want to thank all the folks that were involved in this, but particularly a phenomenal researcher, a grad student who just recently graduated in our lab, Liv Kosterlitz, who was spearheaded most of what I talked about today, and our, and our wonderful colleague at the University of Idaho, a plasmid expert, Ava Top. All the rest of the people were involved in plasmid work that are shown on the slide. And uh, I want to thank these agencies for funding and you all for listening. And I'm sorry to go a few minutes over, but I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you, Ben, for a great uh, talk. And uh, we don't mind if you go over, but then you just have fewer, a little less time for questions. So we'll take uh, Robin's question. Uh, does the rate of plasma transfer for increase if the population is stressed by, by the ambient conditions? Um, that's a, an interesting question. So there's, there's actually um, uh, some interest in whether drugs may actually cause increases in rates of, of transfer. Um, and uh, we, we, we have not done uh, uh, any, any sort of stressing out conditions like let's say temperature or, um, or uh, um, uh, like, altered pH or low nutrient conditions or other things. So I don't have an immediate answer for you. My guess 
would be that the plasma transfer rate, it, it might be an interesting uh, perspective from the, the point of view of the uh, plasmid trying to get to another host, if you, if you think of it that way. Um, there is evidence, by the way, for another vehicle of horizontal transfer to, to alter its rate of exit of, uh, of its host, which is phage. So when, fit, when, when bacteria are stressed out, phage that's incorporated into the, into the uh, chromosome uh, can uh, exit. Um, I don't know the data on plasmids, but for phage, that definitely is the case, which could be a vehicle of horizontal transfer as well. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like a selfish gene, but not a selfish gene, but the selfish plasmids which is a separate entity from the bacterial population. Exactly. So, so the, it, it's, they're very interestingly poised because in some cases you can, you can show that if you have a high enough rate of transfer, you can make a living as an infectious particle. You can do harm to your host, but you can still be maintained in a population with sufficiently high rate of transfer. Um, but in many cases and under certain conditions, plasmids also benefit their hosts. So for instance, in the presence of antibiotics or heavy metals or other sorts of, of selective conditions, plasmids can actually um, uh, uh, be, can be a favorable thing. So they, they, they sort of are in this very interesting space with regards to, again, individuality. Uh, should we consider them as, as, as biological particles or individuals themselves? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We are a little over time, so I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to thank you again um, and ask you to 